Hello, everyone, and let me now welcome you to the uh, sixth keynote session of ACCS 8. And for that, let me introduce to you uh, Professor Nidish Mele Taratil from Amrita Vishwavidya Pido. Professor Nidish uh, currently serves as an associate professor at the School of Biotechnology, Amrita Vishwavidya Pido, Amrita Vuri campus. He received his master's in computer science in 2005 and his PhD in bioinformatics in 2019 from Amrita Vishwavidya Pido. And Professor Nidish has been working with Amrita University for the last 25 years. And his area of expertise is in bio NLP and deep learning. I cordially invite you, sir, Professor Nidish Meletaratil, to chair the session. Uh, hello. A very good afternoon to all the participants of ACS 8th uh, Annual Conference of Cognitive Sciences. Today, I'm very privileged and happy to introduce uh, Dr. Bhavani Rao was kindly agreed to deliver the keynote address on the topic, the role of HCI, human computer interactions, uh, in facilitating social and vocational empowerment. Professor Bhavani Rao is the director of Amrita Multimodal Application Using Computer and Human Interactions Lab, which is known as Amrita Labs, and the Center for Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, which are two uh, major research centers of Amrita Vishya Vidya Bida. Dr. Rao is also uh, act as the uh, dean for the School of uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences of Amrita Vishwa Vidya Bida. More importantly, she, is, she has been dis designated, as the, dis designated as the India's only UNESCO chair in gender equality. Uh, Dr. Rao has extensive research experience in uh, technology-based women empowerment projects throughout rural India, which are funded by uh, various funding, uh, national and international funding agencies, including UNESCO and other uh, national funding agencies. She is the author for more than 150 publications and numerous patents related to vocational skills and uh, hard tricks. She is also the recipient of many awards, including 50 ed Education Innovative Leaders in 2009. Uh, now, on behalf of ACCS 8th uh, Organizing Committee, I invite Professor Bhavani Rao to uh, deliver the keynote address. Thank you, Nidish, uh, for the warm introduction and uh, a very uh, special thanks to the organizers of the conference uh, for having me talk uh, at uh, the very privileged uh, last position, winding up the entire conference and probably setting the tone for the next conference that I'm sure that he is, I, from what I hear and everything that I've, the lectures that I've attended, a very, very successful conference and we hope that there will be many more like this. And so, yeah, so I hope uh, that uh, I'm, I'm able to do justice to the wonderful conference by wrapping up. Uh, a couple of days of uh, wonderful intellectual uh, stimulation. So just following up, I think at the end, we've been so much about the brain. So if it's okay, I would like to bring the conversation down to the heart. And I think, what is it from the heart that also uh, needs to be addressed when you're talking about the brain? And I think uh, that would be kind of uh, where I'm leading the topic to. And uh, I think also that uh, there is so much uh, that we still uh, need to explore in terms about how uh, humans, uh, uh, how the mind works. And so that's why you have this wonderful center that you've set up, Sham. And uh, again, congratulations on, on the wonderful center and the work that you're doing. And so I'll uh, start with my talk. And it's an hour. I don't know if I will be able to take an hour, but I'll be happy to take questions on at the end. So without much ado, let me start my talk. I'll share my screen in just a second. So I am going to talk about the role of HCI um, in facilitating uh, social change and empowerment. And that's what the talk that is going to be about. And as introduced, I uh, am from Amrita University. And uh, I'm sure that this has been already established at the start of the conference. Uh, what is so exceptional about Amrita is that um, the education that is offered at the university is not just about building intellectual capacity, and that is not only for the mind, but it's also for the heart. So we have education for life and education for living. Education for living teaches, gives you the skills to survive in an environment to get a good job, to have all your physical needs met, but education for life is teaches you how to live that life happily. 
and this is something that is very much at the core of education at Amrita. Also something defining about Amrita is the kind of research that is done at Amrita. All research at Amrita is again driven by a very strong sense of bringing your mind and heart and your hands together. And so we, everything that we do has to have societal impact. So you will find that the work that Sham is doing or Nidish is doing is, is not just science for the sake of science, but it's science for the sake of humanity. And therefore my title also of my talk also stands, starts with the word humane and not just human. And therefore, uh, the work that you uh, you find that is done at Amrita is is very richly uh, uh, splattered with with very fundamental grassroots applications of everything that we explore in science. So it's science married to life, uh, and mind married to the heart, and in this case also to the hands, as we would say. So I had a lab, research lab at uh, Amrita University. It's called uh, Amachi Labs. And uh, Nidish was very kind enough to expand on it, but I'm going to go back to this. Amrita Multimodal Applications and Computer Human Interactions. We started this lab predominantly as a computer human interaction lab, and it was dedicated specifically to skill development, um, which is how do you build skills in humans, uh, especially from disadvantaged settings. And so. I'll take you through a bit of our journey. So I'll play a video just to give you an idea overview of the kind of things that we do. Uh, this is only for uh, Amachi Labs and not the Center for uh, Women Empowerment Gender Equality, which is another center, but the two centers work very closely with one another. So it's a quick video and I uh, hope you will enjoy it. And based on what we uh, see in the video, you'll be the talk will follow on some of the topics here. Amachi Lab is the most creative way of empowering women of all of the projects which the UN funds around the world. This is the one dearest to our heart. It's the one we're most proud of. And it's the one that we intend to take to the rest of the world so that they can learn from what you have achieved. The one critical way to survive in a changing environment is to make sure that you have the skills to survive in a changing environment. So we need to either continuously update our skills or acquire new skills to survive in this kind of an environment. We are a multidisciplinary group of close to 100 people. We have engineers, artists, artisans, videographers, social scientists, field workers, volunteers, and exchange students from around the globe, and all working to understand India's complex social problems and together build solutions. With vocational skills training, there's a huge component that you have to do with your hands. So how do you teach something with your hands by using technology? Our methodology is the CWIT methodology. It stands for Computerized Vocational Education and Training. It's a blended learning approach for vocational and life skills. Till date, we have developed over 15 vocational courses and 20 life skills courses and we have used it to train rural women and children across 21 states of india you can't throw technology at difficult social situations and expect it to get better you have to take it there you have to work very sensitively to see how it's going to fit into people's lives they spend their time in the villages along with our end users to really understand their issues from a place of empathy and of connection. We have had a lot of firsts. We have trained India's first women plumbers. We have built the first haptic simulator in the country. We have had tribal women launch Kickstarter campaigns to fund their businesses. We taught women to build and maintain their own toilet, mobilize the community towards ending open defecation. Some now earn a living by building toilets for others in the village. <laughs> वो सचमुच में 
ह्यूमन रिसोर्स डेवलपमेंट स्किल डेवलपमेंट का एक बहुत बड़ा काम है बहने और बेटियां स्वच्छता की दूत तो पहले से ही थे अब आपने स्किल और सशक्तिकरण को भी इससे जोड़ा है All this could not have happened were it not for the guidance, the vision, and the opportunity given by our Chancellor Shri Mata Amrita Nandamayi. So, um, if there is anybody who is interested in the kind of work that we do at Amachi Labs, oops, sorry, trying to pause it. You're most welcome to join us. Um, we happy to have. Uh, it's just putting that uh, out over there. So, uh, so coming back to what we uh, do, and and what you've seen in the video is basically the end effect of the work that goes on in the lab in terms of its deployment. But behind it, there is uh, so much of uh, research and development that actually goes in at the lab. And I will just take you down one vertical. uh that uh, the the lab deals with and it's it's probably also the most important one of the lab is the one that is focused on skill development and uh, and i want you to understand the gravity of skill development as a humanitarian issue not just as an educational issue um considering the fact that we have um in this these are numbers actually that are from 10 years ago and i think coming close to 20 We're coming closer. We have passed 2020. These numbers would be closer to 900 million. We have. We should have, according to C.K. Prahla and some of the books that were written, India would be close to 900 million people, close to 2030, who would need to be skilled in some kind of an income generation, something that would basically increase the kind of income that they make. Uh, and those are the numbers that need to be trained vocationally, if you prefer the word. Um, and the fact is that uh, india the population in india spread out uh, over thousands of villages so it's not like we have uh, pockets of uh, large super large populations and that's uh, where we are we are we are spread out all over um, if we have to train the kind of numbers you're talking about 900 million people you will have to set up centers just all across the Uh, country to give accessibility to these people to have training you, there is uh, um the kind of training needs to be standardized uh, we should be able to scale good quality effective training across the country it should be cost effective it should be available in the local uh languages it should be appropriate to the local context the kind of skills that you're tra uh, training them on it should be available to people with low or almost close to uh, non existent literacy level and very important uh, the kind of uh, uh, problem that plagues this environment is the lack of incentive to even learn so these are the kind of challenges that you're dealing with uh, uh, when you're talking about the skill development landscape in india much of it has got to do with poverty much of it has got to do i mean that i would say would be the 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 root uh, of the the problem would still boil down to poverty um and uh, poverty not in the sense necessarily as we do it but poverty in the sense of lack of access to basic needs uh, is the kind of poverty that i'm talking about and education is a basic need and uh, this kind of education uh unfortunately is like the stepchild of education so for the longest time skill development was like an outsider in the education field um there was uh, over 18 ministries that did their own versions of skill development all over the country there was no standardization not till very recently when the skills the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship was actually set up as a very concerted effect Uh, effort to actually define this space in a much more coherent way and uh, to that uh, extent i think the indian government has done a wonderful job in actually making this a very important national agenda uh, but there is still so much to be done because the the problem and the challenge that we face is is um it's mammoth it's such a it's such a large challenge so this we entered this field in about 2009 uh and this was the time when uh um uh, there was a move uh, in the indian government to actually see if we can act, we can leverage technology to address some of the large 
looming educational problems uh, in India. And somewhere in that entire agenda, somewhere tucked away in a little corner was the, the, uh, the, the topic of skill development and vocational training. Of course, there was hardly any interest in vocational training uh, because education to everybody means uh, the grand road to education. You do your 12th, then you go into college and then you do your master's and then you go into your PhD. This is the known track and of this, the greatest of the tracks is engineering and medicine. Uh, in the Indian psyche, there is no other real worthy uh, livelihood uh, skill that one needs to pick up. Uh, to me, any, any of these and all of these are vocational traits. Being a computer science programmer is a vocational trait, if you ask me, because it gives, gives you a job. Only the pursuit of knowledge can be considered something different. But in if you think of it, all this education, what it does, it gives you a vocation. And therefore, the idea of considering this as something that is different from education in itself creates a stigma. And that is probably another huge fundamental challenge in terms of people's uh, aspiration levels, people's incentives. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the outcast of education. And, uh, and the, these are, again, I'm again giving you a much more uh, holistic idea of the problem landscape. And so the idea is, can you bring technology into this and can it be a disruptive innovation? Can you change the face of vocational training, bringing technology? How do you design that technology to, uh, to basically uh, serve the needs of the people? So who are the people we are talking about? Who, are, who is this group of people that we are designing it for? And of course, it means the 900 million people that we're talking about who need to be trained. But I'm not going to take you down the entire path of it. I'm going to take you down one single path of it. My passion area was women. And I'll tell you why. And so we decided, okay, let's design it for rural women. So now we say, why would you want to design it for women? Why can't you design it for all the 900 million? Specific reasons why I decided, uh, actually, uh, uh, under the guidance of Amma, we decided that let's, we, we work with women. Um, predominantly because they are half of uh, any population, typically but they're also the caretakers of the other half of the population. So women are the caretakers of families, so men included, of the children, of the elderly, of the livestock, of the environment, of the disabled. So they are not only the take caretakers of themselves, but also all vulnerable populations and society as a whole. So in terms of impact, you're, you have a chance of a much greater impact when you design something for a particular population that has such a huge outreach. And yes, we decided women because so much of technology is not designed for women. And we know that this is a, this is a, a very hot uh, topic that is being discussed in all fields, whether it's medicine, whether it's education or just technology, we don't design things for women. So we decided, no, we're going to actually design this for women. And we hypothesized that what we design for women will actually be able to, everybody would be able to use it, but we're going to put them at the center of our design. And also the other appalling thing is that women work really hard, especially in rural areas. They work all the time, but they don't show up in your metrics. They say, oh, uh, so much percentage of your Indian labor force 29 to 30% of your Indian labor force is women. You really look at women, how much they work in the labor force. And you will find actually the numbers are staggeringly more, but they work in the informal sector means you do not know what they do. And so the fact is that can we give recognition to the work that women are doing instead of them being material movers and working in a construction site, carrying sand and bricks, why don't we skill them? Can we give them a better job by doing that? And this is the reason also why we decided let us work with women. Not to mention a whole bunch of other really wonderful facts about women that I won't get into uh, in the gender dialogue so much right now. Um, but yes, let's talk about women. So our primary users were the rural women who were engaged in informal or unskilled labor with no exposure to skilled training, uh, no aspirations really for uh, a kind of a vocation or a kind of a job. 
and basically and very importantly, no technology exposure at all. And of course, along with the women comes all the secondary users, you have their children. So no matter what, you have a class for a woman, always there are two or three hanging over her shoulder, looking into what is happening. They're young students who are come from high school dropouts uh, or people who've figured, uh, who finished their uh, education somehow, but uh, don't have any further skill, industry workers or skill workers who are looking to upgrade their skills. And these are all the secondary work, uh, users, but our primary users were women and the demographic that I showed you, that's, that typically uh, um, explains the kind of people that we're looking to. And, and part of the reason also why we chose women is that if I were to, uh, design the technology for a young boy, the likelihood that the young boy has picked up a screwdriver or been to a motorcycle shop or his exposure to any kind of technology is far greater than that of a woman. So can I design, can we design this technology so that somebody who has had no exposure, not just to the technology that is the interface, but also the technology that they're going to be working with, is, is what I'm designing, it, can it actually be able to bridge both gaps? And that was also part of the challenge that we had uh, to uh, work on. And so that this is the reasons why uh, we chose this particular group. And when we figured if we could do that, then, then our content or what we were designing would be so, uh, uh, so uh, easy to be used by any, any user or any group. And the, this was the reason why we worked with uh, this user. So a question is, is technology overkill? Uh, do we really need technology for this? Uh, so the question is, when do you need, need technology and how do you use it becomes important questions. These are all very um, basic uh, uh, questions when you're designing a product, uh, you're using technology. And uh, so we had, uh, and I won't go into this so much, but we, uh, we designed uh, metrics on uh, to decide what kind of trades uh, would lend themselves best uh, to be taught through a different medium. Um, like maybe agarbati rolling is not exactly the kind of skill that you want to teach somebody through a computerized uh, method, but maybe something like motorcycle maintenance or uh, construction is something that you would want to teach. So what are the criteria that goes into selecting whether a course is, is something that is, is ripe for technology? What are the kind of skills that we need to use technology to train? What is it that can be used, uh, what, ca what can be taught by technology, what cannot be taught by technology, what does not need technology to be taught. Uh, so these are, the, and there are like, each of these things have multiple metrics within it that basically covers exhaustively all the reasons why, and these are weighted, and we uh, use these calculators to design uh, what it is that we want to teach and how it is that we want to teach it and what is the level of technology that we need to bring into it? What is the appropriate uh, technology? So what are the kinds of technologies that we worked with? Of course, ICTs, computers, mobile software, including virtual re reality, um, serious games. Um, also technologies like haptics. So the, the, the ones that we've been, when you, things that we built on the computers were like, um, like uh, specifically de designed uh, uh, videos that could actually really train the people, but also games, simple games that would help with memory, with retention, with processes. But then also we got into far more fundamental things, which is haptics, which is both haptic technology and haptic feedback. And uh, when we started working, it was 2009. It was not a time when uh, the word haptics, when you Google the word haptics, it brought out maybe three links. That's it. It was not a very popular topic at that time when we started uh, our work in it. So there was a lot of fundamental work that we did uh, in terms of uh, designing haptic simulators and, and understanding how haptic feedback worked and how when it was important to use it, when it was not important to use it. This was all things that we actually learned um, uh, from, from scratch. And so, uh, and though for those of you who are not aware of the word haptics, it is the it is the the sense of touch. So it is how do you uh, how does the human interact with the world through touch? 
and what are the technology interfaces that will help you understand the sense of touch like videos and have uh, visual and sensory uh, audio uh, cues and when you're talking about multiple modalities haptics becomes one of the modalities that uh, human interfaces with the environment and uh, like uh, like i mentioned it is it, it, it was a very nascent field in 2009, and even now there is so much to be understood uh, in terms of what haptics is, not just in terms of how to use the technology, but even what is the neuroscience behind the touch, the sense of touch, perception. This is even though consider this, that your skin is the largest organ in your body. So the sense of touch is all over you. And it is a, a very large interface that you have with the environment. And it's still probably one of the least studied uh, of the senses. Uh, the most studied probably is being sight. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and Sham, you can correct me on that, but uh, I would imagine that it would be the visual uh, uh, sense that is that it somehow predominates uh, the way we interact with the world, but there is also um, the sense of touch. Um, the tools that we developed, of course, based on these uh, technologies included very carefully designed video lectures. These video lectures were designed in a way that a rural woman in India with no exposure to that particular subject can actually learn that subject just from that video. So it was, we kind of broke away from classroom learning, uh, no blackboards, no chalk pieces, uh, uh, no standing in front of a camera and talking. It was all video lectures done by doing, by showing, uh, which we made it a lot more complicated, but uh, well worth the effort. But also how it was designed. Uh, of course, interactive games, uh, simple games that will help them uh, remember words, to remember processes, uh, to sequence things, to, uh, to identify what are all the things that are needed for a task uh, and, uh, and such. The assessments, of course. Um, to know how much a person has learned, but not uh, typical the way that it's in a classroom, um, but in a, it could be guised under games, but it could also be something that is direct. Exploratory tools using uh, 3D, which is like 3D glossaries. So if you had objects that you needed to understand, those objects could be explored in a in a in a in a three dimensional library. So you had a repository of uh, all the kinds of tools that you may need for a trade to work with and explore. And then you, of course, had haptics uh, simulators, which is the both the interfaces and the software. Again, both uh, designed in house. And this entire package uh, was a was made sure that uh, that it was available in local languages so that it could actually be uh, used for training. Just a, a quick overview of the different kind of products. Uh, the, the numbers, uh, we've uh, developed four simulators to date. Um, these simu simulators actually have an LMS and analytics also built into them. So there is also intelligence uh, within the simulator. So it's the software plus the hardware. The first picture that you see is, some, is a, a bar bending simulator. And this simulator is actually being actively being used in all the CSTIs of Larson and Tubro. So it was custom built for uh, training people in bar bending operations. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's probably the only one of its kind in the entire world. Um, and it's uh, being used and it's actually quite uh, successful because this is uh, one of the trades where there is maximum uh, material loss. Uh, and therefore, it's very expensive because of material loss. Because once you practice on a bar, you are basically throw out the bar. You don't reuse the bar. And uh, therefore, the simulator becomes uh, very useful. Now, we have over 15 uh, uh, vocational training courses uh, from very simple ones to very complicated ones. So we have all the way from NSQF level one to level six. And uh, our courses are offered on eSkill India platform, on the eSkill India platform, which by the way, the Kaushal Sangam eSkill India platform was also built by us. Uh, actually, that should be one of the products listed over here. We have had over a, a, a lack or more students in eSkill India in terms of enrollment, not to mention the thousands that we have trained ourselves across uh, different villages. This is purely eSkill India enrollments. We also have... Uh, uh, 
virtual reality uh, workshops, uh, both in the vocational trades, but also in soft skills, like for communicating, uh, uh, for uh, training students to attend interviews uh, and things like that. So these are the kind of uh, products that have come out of the lab. Now let's go get down into the details. So I'm going to take you, I don't know how long uh, I will take for the entire presentation. So I'm not going into the, the, the design details for uh, all the uh, other um, thing, but I will kind of go a little bit deeper into haptics because haptics is, 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 a, is a very interesting HCI problem. Uh, you have two aspects to it. Like I said, you have the technology, which is the interfaces that you build, but also the feedback that you're getting and the software design that happens uh, at the background. And so I'll take a little bit into the, the design of uh, haptics and its implementation. And these are some of the haptic simulators that you see. Uh, we designed uh, something called the Apta. This is for uh, tools that have certain kind of functions, certain kind of movement, a mill and lathe simulator, bar bending simulator that I talked about earlier. Another one that we call Chakra. This is for rotary tools. Um, these things, uh, tools that have a rotational kind of a, a movement in it. And we designed also something called smart tools. This can be add on interfaces to a tool so that it guides you in its training so these were called smart tools and these were the overall the um, overview of the products that we designed so why why would you use haptics so so typically our metrics so when when you actually build a simulator is if uh, the costs are high whether it's a material cost or the tool cost is really expensive it is difficult to set up the infrastructure because the tools are really big and large and you can't set up these centers everywhere to train people um, or the materials are difficult to store. They have expiry dates. Uh, these are all nuances that where it, it becomes difficult to actually set up training centers unless you have a constant flow of students to make it practical or to make it uh, economically viable. Skilled teachers are hard to find. And this is some, this is a problem that plagues the entire country is consistent skilled teachers quality and uh, consistency among teachers is very difficult um, to find uh, in India. And, and, and there are many reasons for this. I'm not sure if I can get into it, if there are questions. Yeah, and um, the last is that safety is a significant concern. So are we putting the person in danger, especially if they're not used to that, uh, those tools or that particular task, if it is dangerous for them, uh, would that this is actually something that is a very important uh, consideration in in when do you use uh, what kinds of technology so the way we went about it uh, is uh, is a is a characterization of we took about 500 tools from different trades from all the trades uh, that have that use similar kind of tools uh, we classified these 500 tools in terms of the kind of grasp that they use, the kind of functions that they use, the workspace, um, the metrics. How do you use this? So it's it's many many different criteria. And this is this was like our blueprint for design. So these 500 tools were characterized and based on the commonalities of the way to use uh, these tools and how to use these tools, uh, we came up with our first two designs, which is called the Apta and the Chakra. One is a linear uh, device and then the other one is a rotary linear in the sense that predominantly the use of the tool was in a single direction, uh, in a single plane. And uh, that's how the, the tools would typically be used and to use, so commonalities in, in graphs. And so, so we, we kind of designed these modular sections. So um, one section was the movement of the tools was pretty predominantly in one plane as opposed to multiple planes and using the entire three-dimensional space. Um, uh, the other was the kind of grasps. How do you handle it? Do you hold it with one hand? Do you hold it with two hands? Uh, how do you use your body? And, and so that, that was another part of the design. And so, and what, what are the functions? So we came up with uh, two specific tools that we thought covered the maximum number, could simulate the maximum number of tools in the software interfaces. And like I said, the APTA, which was basically did uh, things along one plane, and the second was the chakra, which was basically held, did everything in terms of rotational kind of things. So things that you had to have a rotational uh, degree of freedom and, and stuff like that. So these were the two uh, uh, generic designs that we distilled from our characterization. 
And uh, what we did was we also designed drafts that were modular. So maybe one tool, you had to hold it this way, the other tool, you had it to hold it like this. So depending on the graph, we designed drafts that fit into, uh, could you could just plug on to your main device. So your haptic feedback came from one place, your grasps were detachable and attachable, your grasps had their own feedback in it, haptic feedback in it. So there was multiple layers of design in the interfaces uh, to the thing. The software side of it, um, had its own uh, design thing. So how do you know that the task that is being done is being done right? So you had to measure all the things from the device, but it had to make sense uh, and it had to have its own intelligence uh, within the software. So uh, the way we did that was we uh, would, once the device or, a, uh, or it could be at the haptic device or it could be uh, an actual tool that was retrofitted with uh, sensors that basically captured all the movements of an expert. So we would line up a set of experts and we would measure all their actions, whatever they did to use that tool. And that became our metric for evaluation. So this is how we evaluated uh, the students. So they became the baseline. This is, this is the benchmark. The experts are the benchmark. So we took several ex uh, experts, uh, recorded their movements and created what was the ideal or the optimal way to use a tool based on the experts use. And the, the people who were using the, uh, the simulator and the interfaces that we built, we would record the same uh, movements and the same uh, things from the students and then map it, match it to the expert and then uh, evaluate their degree of performance or their level of performance uh, uh, based on that and give feedback uh, based on these things. So it was a lot, uh, it's just uh, just uh, some examples of uh, things like uh, what is the, how do you, at a very, very high level, how do you make sure that, that the student is doing all the right kind of things in performing a task? Uh, just to give you, a, just to give you a, just a very brief glance into the amount of detail that went into designing uh, these devices in terms of, uh, HCI and, and how do how to make that part of it work. Um, take you now a little bit more into some of the, the design challenges we had on the UI UX uh, side of things. Of course, this was very important. We have to remember that this was for low literacy users. So people for, who did not really have an exposure on computers, who have never used computers before or tablets or mobile phones. And uh, they were completely new to also the topics that were being taught. So there's just so many uh, levels of uh, challenges. So, yeah, so we knew that we had to have, of course, uh, whatever that we were building was, we had to make sure that it was uh, available to all across India. So it had to be uh, uh, very language friendly. Uh, it could not be too rooted in, in, uh, in languages. So it would be language friendly in the sense you could easy to convert from one language to another. Uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, the games that we designed had to be something that were generic enough that could be used across multiple courses. So we didn't have to rebuild game engines over and over again. Uh, the user interface had to be uh, easy to use. Um, um, yeah, and yeah, it's just uh, many, many uh, layers of uh, things that we had to uh, consider uh, while designing these interfaces. And let me just take you back to one thing. So uh, for example, if you were using a mouse, so we make sure that uh, the, the way the, the course rolls itself out uh, is also that the kind of basic mountain, you have to remember this was mountain interactions was when tablets uh, and mobile phones were not that uh, uh, ubiquitous and it was not that cheap to get a tablet at I don't, 2009, I'm not even sure that tablet technology was that out. It was, I don't think it was really out also as much. Um, so predominantly the medium of instruction was through computers. And of course your first interface with the computer becomes your mouse. And uh, even through the, the course, right from the time you logged in to the computer all the way till you started doing the more complicated things, we made sure that there was a progressive way you used even your mouse. So for example, login only involved a click. And the next would be next level of complexity in using a mouse would be click and drag. And so whether your classroom or organizers, it'd be click and then you drag 
click, drag, and then your works would workbook would be click, drag, uh, drop, interact, and it would get to have one level more of a complexity. If you went into the glossary, then you would have another layer where you would spin an object and you would you would manipulate an object in three D space. Uh, and then uh, eventually, then you have the haptics, which is a far more complicated interface. So uh, even 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 in um, even taking a person through the the course, where from the time you started, slowly we would increase the complexity of actually just even using a mouse, um, just so that the the technology at some point should be completely transparent to the human, and that's why we put in this care and. Um, yeah, and I'll come a little. I'll come back to the the story of the mouse uh, when I give you some of the lessons learned later. And similar kind of uh, thought went into the way we design the content uh, and things like that. But I'll talk to you talk to you about things that you probably would not come across otherwise in other places. It, not just in in designing the content. We realized when it came to implementation, there was another huge level of design that we had to come up with. So you create this content and these fantastic tools, but how do you actually create a classroom with it? So what would be your model? That was the next level of challenge that we had. So you have to remember all this still falls very much within the space of human computer interaction. You're designing the technology, but you also have to really design it for the users, but also how do people actually work with it? How do you get them to, interact with that technology at that comfort level so um and th the the part of the the design was that uh, at the core of the design was not just to use the technology on purely for training but to make that training meaningful to them and this was somehow we made this as the core of our approach so just a training for the sake of training. Okay, we set up a tailoring center, you put 10 tailoring machines, you teach them, they go back, they do whatever with it. So it was not that. And it was not even as simple as that. Oh, you come, you learn something, and then you get a job, or you get a livelihood, fine. But we actually put a lot more into it because at the fundamental of this challenge was to create the aspirations. And so we made it like a community agenda. So skills was not just an individual agenda, it became a community agenda. What did people want to do about making their lives better? What mattered to them? And we started from there and then skills became a means to achieve what mattered to them. So we had to design how we even introduce skills into the space. So we would uh, bring women together, identify what it is that they really wanted for their community, and then identify what skills they would need in terms of vocational skills, in terms of life skills to achieve what they wanted, and then introduce the vocational training with the computerized elements of it. So these are the kind of uh, uh, grassroots level changes we had to make in terms of even introducing something like vocational training to the uh, to the to this audience. Uh, and uh, the map on the left kind of shows you the, the places that we have been working in, the states we have been working in. I think it also gives you the villages that we have been working in, but also what are the kind of trades that we have taught and what is the kind of social change that has come about uh, working uh, with these uh, with the women in these particular states. It just gives you an idea of our outreach. So yeah, so we talk about blended learning, right? It's so easy to say blended learning, which means half computers, half direct uh, training. But in a vocational space, there are so many elements to it. So what actually constitutes this perfect blend? How much time does somebody spend on the technology? How much time do they spend in learning theory? How, many, how much time do they spend in actually doing uh, the practical? And this is something that we had to have an iterative process where we would take and we would go back. So there were so many different things that we had to, to experiment with and learn to kind of come up with what we felt finally was the perfect blend. And you have to remember that these classes are like classes in the wild. This is like, you could take the tablets and you can sit under a tree and actually have a training kind of thing. So you also, this is not a formal setting. So what the perfect blend in an informal setting would be very different from what the perfect blend would be in a formal setting, which is another thing, another ballpark. So how would you design a vocational training center with this kind of technology? How would you actually mix and match the different elements of training to make 
sense that it all it all comes together so this is another level of what is a perfect blend and uh, and i'm not going because i'm sticking to the the rural women so i'm not going to go into this uh, as much as a detail and i'll i'll pick out uh, the uh, lessons uh, for you that that may be of interest uh, to you so when when i was talking about the mouse interaction how it is it's your fundamental interface to the computer uh, we found it very difficult to teach them click drag drop it just did not work out. Somehow they were always ending up shutting down the computer or whatever and things or they would click all over the place. So we designed a game really simple. This is something that we've all played as uh, played on. I played as a child, you know, pin the tail on the donkey. Everybody does it, you know, blindfolded and you have to go and pin the uh, tail onto the donkey. We modified that, but it pin the tail onto the elephant. So there's a little elephant that would lose its tail. And what you had to do with the mouse is you had to pick up the tail and then you'd have to put it onto the butt of the elephant so that it pins it on. And this was such a hit with the women. Suddenly it was not about computer and they were not, worried about the computer they were suddenly playing a game and they loved the fact elephant gets so happy when the tail is pinned on and so they would just like keep on doing it so that they would make the elephant happy and so this whole thing about clicking on the tail dragging the tail and dropping it in the right place became a smooth exercise uh, with this very very simple game uh, that we designed but we really learned from that is also that we had to keep our uh, interfaces for the designs super simple. We can't have too many menus cluttering it and just menus would just confuse them. So as much as possible audio instructions uh, uh, to tell them what to do next in your in your training, uh, in your practical, of course, that would that would change. But initially it was all instruction based instruction was primarily audio. It was not so much written instruction because it would have been too much of a cognitive load on them to read and figure it out. So the audio really helped. Also, audio is easier for us to change when you're changing from one language to the other. If you put text into a video, then to redo the video in another language becomes another level of complexity. So we really leveraged uh, the audio modality to, to um, converting almost all instruction to an audio form as opposed to a text form. Where we use text was sparingly, Actually, we use text to build literacy. So in your glossary, where you had to learn the names of the tools, where you had to learn basic concepts, basic, uh, 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 so anything that was fundamental. So whatever was in your glossary, that is where the written also came because what you did is you re-emphasized the written uh, part of it, them to read uh, uh, what was written uh, through the glossary because it's only terms, it's short terms. And, and that's that's kind of where we try to limit our uh, thing. Like if you, um, uh, the, the game on the right, it's it's just it's just two words, one word. Uh, that's kind of where the, the text comes in so that their reading is not, doesn't go over a sentence uh, actually. So that slowly, slowly they pick up their reading skills also. And every single text would have a mouse rollover voiceover. So you could actually know what was being said uh, if you're having a problem reading it. Um, yeah, so that is a little bit about uh, the games. Uh, what we found also was that uh, initially when we were designing the classrooms that we, we tried to keep it only to the women. So the women had to come and we were being serious about it. but there is a great apprehension in in the women in actually interfacing with technology to begin with and what we found is when you can't really keep the children out anyway so no matter what if a mother comes her children are always over her shoulder looking in but what we found is actually that the children have no in uh, there's nothing to inhibit them uh, into exploring technology. So oftentimes the children would actually teach their mothers on how to use it. And when the child is handling the tablets, they're not so afraid that they're going to break it or something. So they start getting bold and they start using either the tablet or the computer. So uh, it would help the mothers basically um, transcend any fear they have of technologies to have the thing. So then our classes became very open mothers, but mothers with children became uh, and they, second is uh, with the haptic simulators. What was very interesting is tools that were a little difficult or a little scary, like the drill, um, those kind of tools, when we put them on a simulator first, and then we put them onto the real tool, they were far more comfortable using the real tool uh, 
after going through a simulator than before going through the simulators. Initially, that kind of like using a power drill was scary for women because they thought they would hurt themselves. Uh, they, but uh, the control environment of a simulator actually gave them a sense of things. Second is uh, seeing their friends doing it uh, was another uh, layer of uh, comfort. And this also made us uh, realize that um, uh, in in having women and I, I'll come I'll come to that point a little later. Uh, use of colors and symbols is interesting. I was having a conversation with Sham where uh, he was saying that the previous speaker actually said that uh, sense of color and symbols is something that is uh, not uh, context uh, specific, and I'm not quite sure what they meant about it. But anecdotally, I can tell you that context matters a lot. Uh, in terms of colors. And here is an anecdote I would like to share with you. The reason I'm sharing with you is um, I really feel that, uh, and, and this is a well-established thing, uh, I think it's important for people from India or from the global south, we should be doing our own experiments and we should be doing our own scientific validation of any research that is being done in the West. Uh, we do not know if something is generally applicable to all humans unless we do our own uh, research. Uh, something that has been done in the in the United States, even if it is done with a diverse uh, demographic, it is still the United States, and they will not ever be able to capture the cultural nuances of something that is in India. People who are in urban India will not have the same sensitivity, the same context that you have in rural India. So you have to be you have to know that these things change from place to place. And unless you have yourself validated it and you have done it in your this thing, then uh, you should accept these things as universal. Otherwise, what you will end up having is a universal uh, white male mind as opposed to uh, really reflecting all the, the diversity in human thought. Uh, and sorry if, if I, I do hope I don't offend anybody by saying that, but it's something that we should be careful about. For, the, for example, let me talk about the color red. Very typical for all of us, even our little uh, zoom, if you scroll up, you will have a little green button to maximize and you have a little red button to close the application. This is standard across whether it's Windows applications or Mac applications. We know red means close, we know red means stop. Well, why do we know that it means stop? And why do we know that it means danger? Has anybody really thought about it? So we had, of course, nice little red buttons that was to close a program. And then when we rolled it out, we found that the women were always closing programs. Every two minutes they would close and they say, it's closed. And then it was like, why? So I hit the little red button. And it took us some time that red is a very attractive color. I mean, women love red. They wear red bangles, they wear red saris. Red is an auspicious color in India. We like red, we appreciate red. Red doesn't mean danger. And the reason we think red means danger is because we have traffic lights that say red is stop, green is go. In rural India, you don't have traffic and you don't have traffic lights and you don't have that big nice red stop signs that tell you stop. So you don't associate the color red with danger or with stop. So for us, we had to take the color out of any close signs or stop signs, we just had to do it because if you put red, they went for red, like bulls, you just went for it. So in, in terms of design, we, we just had to go away from a nice common red X button. X they understood, X I think, because many of them at least studied first grade, second grade school. And so they would get nice big X's uh, if they did an answer wrong and a nice stick when they got their answers right. So that much of exposure was there to a cross symbol. So they knew cross means something that was wrong, but still the color itself was a very attractive color. And we only figured that the, that only, only when we actually really changed that color did we stop having this disastrous thing where they kept on closing the programs. Very interesting, another, another anecdote, very particular to only one community. In a rural village in Haryana, the thumbs up is a challenge. It doesn't mean appreciation. So if you did this to a person, it means, what the hell do you mean? Or who the hell, who are you? It's, it's an open challenge when you do a thumbs up. So that symbol that is so common to us on Facebook, Twitter, no matter what, you just like, oh, you hit the thumbs up sign because you like something. Don't try it in rural Haryana. They'll come at you if you told, show a thumbs up. So it's, it's something that we have taken so much for granted, but it's an artificial uh, conditioning that we have to understand that the word this this particular symbol is a sign of appreciation. It is not uh, universal. 
So we have to, again, when we are designing for the rural population, either you decide to educate everybody that this is a, a symbol of good, which is fine, uh, but you lose cultural nuances and the beauty of culture is its diversity. Am I going over time and close to my one hour? I apologize for that. Um, another important lesson, and I will just kind of stop with this, is that it was very important for us to group women uh, in terms of uh, how they learn things. So it was one to one uh, doesn't work as much with technology as two to one is uh, what we said. And uh, just uh, I was hoping maybe I, if I had time to show some a couple of other videos on the haptic devices, but I think I'm out of time. Uh, out of time, uh, just to show that the technologies that we developed, we kind of used it in multiple scenarios, whether it was in higher education institutions across our campuses, uh, whether it's in formal vocational training centers, informal vocational training centers, in schools. Uh, and also uh, online, completely online, with like I was telling about the Kaushal Sangam, which also won the Facebook award in 2012 for being the most innovative product for women's empowerment. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I can kind of close and I can, I don't know, I guess I don't have time for questions, but if there are, I'd be happy to take it offline even. Thank you, Shan, and thank you, Nidish. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani. It was an excellent talk and, uh, and uh, thanks for a wonderful lecture. I'm sure that the talk was, has given a, a, a deep insight into the problems faced in the domain of skill development uh, and, uh, and, and the use of ICD and uh, you know, haptics for uh, you know, uh, addressing those problems. Also, actually, thanks, to, thanks for sharing those actual experience where uh, you know, uh, which you, know, uh, you had while you were implementing this uh, program. And uh, to the audience, I'm sure that like, you know, uh, you must have got a good insight into the uh, actual problems and uh, how haptics and uh, 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 haptics could be, uh, you know, a tool uh, to uh, address these problems or how, uh, uh, how we can use uh, these tools. And I, I, I would say like, you know, we also, uh, we all should try to uh, uh, see how uh, the similar technologies uh, can be uh, used in our uh, skill development programs. And uh, also, I would say like, you know, the skill development is uh, something which is, uh, has got its uh, prominent uh, emphasis or, uh, you know, in the, in the new national education policy, there is a you know, uh, higher emphasis given for the skill development. Yes, and, uh, very nice. Uh, yeah. But, uh, Bhavani, I have a question. So, um, uh, I know we work together in a different sense, but I was wondering whether uh, some of the data that you presented in terms of case study, where can we find the references to them? There are some of the, some of it is in the publications that have come out of the lab, for sure. Um, there's a lot of blog posts also that we've done, if you're just interested in, in the, what has happened in the field and, and uh, on a most of it. If you want hardcore data, uh, you should find it in the publications. There are certain things that we haven't published, like for example, the characterization uh, thing, that is kind of like an internal blueprint that we have used to, to design our simulators. Um, so those have not been actually published. So that is uh, our internal reference uh, for building our products. Um, so I'm not quite sure what is what exactly, which area are you looking at the haptics side of it? Are you looking at the, 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 um, you, you can, can, what, what, which, which uh, is your interest area in that? Just a small add-on. Um, we were curious because we, as you know, we also do the virtual labs. I'm just saying whether mm -hmm. we should be, do you expect people like us to also see similar patterns in the data that we generate out of these kind of virtual tools that we use? In our case, of course, the higher education only in post graduations or uh, undergraduate students at the maximum at the basic level. Do you think that will be a similar trend that you will expect in this kind of? Uh, and if if we do an analysis or if we do something that you have done, do you think this trend will be different from this pattern that you see, or will it be? We have to. That would be a fun thing to explore. Actually, um, what I found is. Uh, um, some of the, uh, like when we've taken the, the tools that we have actually built for rural India and we've uh, deployed it in the Amrita Vidyalayam schools, 
uh, the students really enjoy working uh, with the with the software, interacting with it, and playing. Uh, very different results. Uh, oftentimes, what we have seen is that the students really get interested in computer sciences when you actually get them uh, doing these uh, these particular activities. So a lot of things is like, how can I build something like that? Would uh, can I learn computer science? Can I learn how to build these kind of things? This is something that we have seen a lot. Uh, when we deploy in schools, um, which is an interesting thing. Of, um, I have never seen a comparison uh, between, I actually really, to be very honest, not looked in depth in how the OLABs are designed. I've seen a little bit of it. Our approach is also a little different. Like for example, um, in OLABs, you, you will uh, look at a video on how something is done, and then you will read up the theory for it, and then you'll go through the practical thing, and then you will do your simulated, exercise in it. So the way we do things in uh, in the vocational training is you first do the hands-on. So for example, so you're, you're training a woman in masonry and she's learning how to build a toilet. So early in the morning, you start by doing the actual physical exercises of actually being, so the sun is not so high, it's not so hot. They actually learn to mix the cement to the sand with the proportions they're doing. And it, then in the afternoon, when the sun is high, you don't actually work on the thing. It's that's when you actually go back and you actually read up everything that you did, what you did in the morning. So relating to what was done becomes so much easier for them. They understand. Otherwise, you lose them because they now if that will work with students, I would I would think that it would. Uh, I have a very strong, um, again, this is just opinions, not validated, but we know that 10% uh, of people going to tertiary education, 90% of the population goes into vocational education, formal or informal. And yet the 10% of this population is designing education for the 90%. How does that make any sense? They learn differently. Actually, most humans learn differently. They don't learn from abstract to concrete, they go from concrete to abstract. So to the idea, actually I have a very interesting slide that I prepared for the difference between O labs and uh, uh, skill labs and what is it it's it's uh over there is the labs that are designed for school is is you do something to understand theory but you've given them the theory already and you're just doing something here it is not that it's here you experience the world and you distill the theory from it uh, it's a different approach entirely i would like to think that this is more effective but hey why don't we take that uh, take that up as a research study and uh, figure that out Thank you. You addressed my question. Thank you. One other question, uh, Bhavani Ma'am. You know, do we have, uh, have we incorporated the augmented reality while we were, you know, designing these experiments? In the beginning, we did do some augmented reality, but like I said, it was very nascent when we, 2010, 11, it was very nascent. Uh, and the thing was with, uh, yeah, we, you have to have very good uh, use cases for it. And um, since we, yeah, we didn't go so much into augmented, we did do a couple of experiments. They were mostly experiments that uh, stayed within the lab uh, and we didn't even really take it out into the field. So not directly, we didn't do augmented reality, um, but more on virtual reality, we did do a lot. And uh, do we have any data, you know, the post-COVID situation with respect to the skill development or vocational training for the? Yes, it was very interesting. So we were running actively running PMKBY centers uh, across the country when the lockdown happened. Uh, it was actually very easily many of our groups just shifted to online uh, training, even even though it was a vocational space. So the teachers would uh, teach over their mobile phones, and the students were attending classes. Um, there was a, a very heroic effort to move the entire thing into an online mode. Uh, we we had to pause because I mean there's there was uh, the hands-on part of it still didn't happen. But we uh, when we reopened when the, the lockdown pressures came down, we had almost everybody return, come back, do a refresher, take the exams, and clear the exams also. And this is kind of very rare uh, in the domain that we work. It's usually talk about 70% dropout rates, uh, very few people actually clearing exams. So considering everything, we've had amazing successes uh, in the people we train. Uh, you know, I don't see any other questions from the participants and it is time is almost uh, beyond uh, one of our, uh, so, uh, Sean, do you think like we will wind up or? 
Please do. Yes, thank you. Sorry. So on behalf of this organization of so uh, ACCS, uh, uh, I will I uh, thank Dr. Bhavani Rao and. Uh, I would like to mention that, like, you know, what do you do is uh, the real translational research, which actually gets into the benefit of the people. And we all are proud of what you do, Bhavani uh, Shichi and the team. And thank you. on behalf of uh, the committee, the organizing committee, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Nidish, for chairing the session in a well-ordered manner. And thank you for giving your time and being here with us, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Dr. Bhavani, for delivering us with such an insightful talk. Thanks for educating us about the challenges in skill development in India, like um, where should the technology be applied to bring the best out of it, and also for introducing, introducing us uh, with some of the products like the haptic simulators, which uh, happened to came out of the lab. And more than anything, thank you so much, ma'am, for like reminding all of us who is growing through the field of science that mm, science is not for the sake of science, but science for the sake of humanity. Thank you so much.